Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at the first submission by um, Marielle and Anja. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing either of those names correctly, but uh, I'll let you correct me later on. Um, I'm also going to include in this, in the description, a link to um, some more photographs of this horse and some other little video clips where uh, she works the horse over a five-week period. And they're really great videos. I'm suggesting that everyone really go and take a look at these because you can so clearly see the development of this horse from uh, the beginning to the end in these still photographs and little videos that she does leading up to this and uh, how she brought the horse along. And really has done a great, great job. And once again, you can really see the horse transform in those uh, pictures. So once again, I'm going to put the link to that in the description part of this video. So please be sure and hit on that link and go and take a look at that because it's quite interesting. And you can really see the horse develop. Now this video is a little difficult, obviously, because it's a stationary video. And we're having to see sometimes the horse is very far from us, which is not an ideal thing for your future videos. It would be much better if you can find somebody to operate the... Uh, video zoom on there for you but uh, we'll do the best we can here but once again you've done a really good job of bringing this horse along this is a seven-year-old Frisian she's had a baby um, she looked like a brood mare once again it's just you know when horses are not worked regularly they just lose all muscle tone just like a person who stands around doing nothing so of course if horses were actually out in the wilds and moving over thousands of acres they might stay in some kind of physical condition but you know, even a couple of hundred acres is not enough to really get horses exercised the way, you know, nature would do so if they were moving constantly. Um, so brood mares and just any horse standing around, just like a person, you know, if you're going to sit around for a, a year, you're going to have no muscles at the end of that year. And that's pretty much what you say with this horse. And this is a very long backed horse. And we very see, uh, we talk about all the time, how almost every Frisian we see these days is sway backed because they've usually been bought by if they're going to be riding horses, bought by somebody who's a very large person with the idea that this big horse is going to carry them around. But unfortunately, because they are so big and because they're so long in the back, they have very, very weak back. So even just the weight of their own body, as you see with this horse, just standing in a field as a broodmare, you know, her belly was just being pulled down. Once again, gravity is taking control there. If we're not exercising those top line muscles, the back just collapses in the middle and uh, that's what you see with this horse. And once again, it's great to go and look at these photographs that uh, in this other site where you can see the development of the horse because uh, this has been really good developmental work that you've done so far with this horse. And I already see a huge improvement uh, in those pictures and videos um, compared to what the horse started with. So just know that it's going to take about a year to establish a top line on this horse and about two years to confirm it. And it's about what it takes, whether you're starting with an older horse or a younger horse, it's about the same amount of time. Once again, if you read any good book on the subject from the Spanish Riding School to Block, to Klaus Bockenhall's works and uh, or Klimke's, they all say the same thing. You know, I mean, dressage is based on letting horses develop slowly over time rather than trying to force them into frames. So once again, uh, this horse will develop and develop really beautifully. And you've already got her well on the way. So everything you're doing, I'm, I don't have a problem with. Um, there was a, a, a brief couple of photographs in the other uh, group of photographs that I saw that you showed me with the horse uh, where you have the um, a line going from the horse's mouth between the horse's legs and up over the horse's withers. And I mean, that's not a bad thing to do, but I would certainly be very careful of it and I wouldn't do it very often. I think a shambone is a better and safer way to go about that because were the horse to actually pull or fall down with that rope like that, I mean, you could really injure the horse's withers with that. So while it seems to have worked for you this time, I wouldn't continue ever doing that again just for those for those reasons. Because if a horse ever fell with that on, you know, as I said, they could just really break their break their wither, so to speak. And we don't want to have that happen because that rope could, would tighten down there. So Shambone is a better bet. But you've done a really good job of bringing this horse along. It's really starting to swing very nice and actively over its back. And as I said, in these other photographs that you show, um, we can clearly see the development really better than we can on this because just the horse is just so far away from us once again in this video. Um, so in the future, yes, we need to find somebody to work the Zoom for us. But once again, you've done a really good job and you're certainly on the right track. I didn't, you know, as I said, other than that one piece of equipment that you used there, and it doesn't look like you continued to use that. So very good. And you switched over to the shambone and got the horse stretching. But as you can see, when we can see the horse here and get a little better look at it, you know, we can see how undeveloped the horse is um, behind the saddle there. And you can see how sort of you neck she is underneath. But once she stretches out, you really see the difference in the horse. And that's what's so beautiful about this system. You know, once you begin to see it and you begin to see the top line, 
um, which is a real skill. You never forget that. I mean, I'm very surprised how often I see people who, you know, just, you know, they haven't developed their eyes. They're looking at the wrong part of the horse. So we must learn to look at the whole horse and look at the whole top line. And once again, not think about developing the hindquarters. Yes, we want the hindquarters. We want the whole top line developed, not just the hindquarters. So we see a lot of horses, um, you know, that have been compressed from back to front. And they develop these bread loaves kind of over their loins, you know, which is incorrect muscle developing. But then there's no, no muscle under the back where the saddle goes and the saddle, you know, and you see, you know, clearly how the, the back dips away at the wither. So that's what we have to avoid. But you're well on your way to correcting all the problems with the source. This is going to be a really fun one to see develop over time uh, because it is a very long horse. But as I said, you've already done a good job. Everything I saw in those photographs showed me a, a clear and correct development uh, starting anyway with that. Now, as to this, once again, it's just a little difficult you know, to see here with the uh, picture as small as the horse often is. But I do see it developing in the right direction. You see you can have the shambone on in this case. And once again, you just want to keep going to get the stretch all the way down in the walk, which you do. And that's also a, a, a big thing with these really big horses. You know, you really need to do a lot of walk work um, with the really big ones that really just need to get swinging over their back because they can be, um, as you have found out, you know, these kind of big horses like this can be so completely out of sync one end to the other. I mean, they're literally like, Two big people, two big men in a, in a horse suit with no connection between the two. So taking your time in the walk and really getting them swinging. That's the beauty of the walk. And once again, you see when this horse goes by in silhouette there, you can see how the belly is dropped. It really hasn't started to pull up. And remember, it's not just the back. It's like core training. Correct training for a horse is just like correct training for a person. We engage the entire core. So our abdominal muscles has a lot to do with the strengthening of our back. So same thing with a horse. And you know, we want to see that abdominal wall tighten. You, you know, begin to see a line form along the edge of the rib cage instead of this sort of distended look that the horse has, almost, you know, like it's getting ready to have a fall, you know, so which is what we don't want. You know, and just like a person, you know, the quicker you get back in shape, you know, after having a child, for instance, uh, you know, um, the sooner you're going to get back. In other words, the sooner as you start working on it actively, you're going to get your body back in shape much quicker because you don't want to get, you know, um, it would be better to keep our, our horses um, as we often did when I was young. You know, we would ride um, pregnant mares for quite some time, you know, and then let them off, you know, month or two before, but you know, they could certainly be exercised and walk and that sort of thing and uh, thereby keep their bodies in shape. So once again, even a horse, once its back drops, it's going to be important to breeding because when the back drops, once again, everything is going to shift. Once again, that's why we see so many horses that are hollow, they colic so often because once again, the abdominal muscles are part of the digestive system. So if the horse has just let all those go, so to speak, just like a person who's let their abdominal muscles go, they're going to have a lot more intestinal problems than uh, somebody who has not. So this is even something to be thought about in terms of your brood mares. You know, once again, you know, keeping them fit before they, uh, you get them pregnant and then keeping them on some kind of regimen, you know, uh, at least uh, most of the way through to keep them just in shape and working over their backs, even, that, even if that's just walking, which is perfectly fine. Now going into the trot here, we can see the source is quite hollow. Once again, you see how the hind legs are kind of, it improves as we go. But once again, starting off there, you can see how high-headed the horse is. It's really just kind of collapsing its back in the middle. And you can see how the hind legs are clearly not moving in sync with the front. They're kind of falling out the back once again. So the horse should be uh, lifting its hind legs long before uh, they stay on the ground as long as this one is doing starting off there. So once again, that's the, one of the first things to train your eye to look at. I mean, just look how the horse is bracing upwards and you see how it's, it's basically pulling itself along kind of by its shoulders while the hind legs are kind of falling out behind and not really reaching under the body. So here you did the right thing. I wouldn't continue to do much of that until if the horse isn't right and that's just the thing to do. Try it. It's just like with the canner, you know. If your horse is a bad canner, I'm not telling you never to canner, but it's best that you work on the trot work, build the horse's back, and then come back to the canner once a week or every two weeks or however long it takes and just try it and see how the canner feels. When the horse gets over its back, it will magically improve the canner. But once again, a lot of cantering on a hollow horse is just going to make them foot sore and make them sore in the back. So we want to avoid that. Because remember, the faster you go, the more pressure there is on the horse's feet. And 
that's what getting a horse over its back does. It, it relieves the pressure on the horse's front feet because the horse becomes kind of like a four-wheel drive. They become kind of equalizing their weight, so to speak, so they can balance and not just be on their forehand. But once again, remembering, uh, taking that the next step further is you cannot pull a horse off of its forehand by pulling its head up in the air. You know, um, as you see with saddle breads and some of these kind of horses where they jack the feet up, they, you know, they put these six inch long shoes on to make them look like they're uphill. I mean, you know, they break the tails to make them look like the horse is holding his tail out because when a horse is correctly work or, or working over its back, it will hold its tail up and away from the body a little bit, it's kind of completing that round picture that we see in the horse. So those kinds of uh, uh, practices of breaking tails and headsets and dumb jockeys, they used to call them, which were things that horses, the bidding rigs that people put on horses standing in stalls, you know. These kind of all devices, you know, need to go the way of the guillotine and <laughs> other torches devices from the past. Uh, so once again, a really good job here that you've done so far. I like how you just let that go along quietly. Once again, you came back to the walk when the trot was not so good, and that's exactly what you do want to do because you don't want to keep trotting when the horse is upside down. Once again, if you can't get it, you know, kind of one, two, three is always my rule of thumb on anything. If I can't get something in three tries, which might be around the ring, you know, three or four times around a circle or three minutes, I'm going to certainly go back to what came before. And that's the beauty of the classical system, once again. Instead of trying to fight your way through a wall with your horse, realize that almost all difficulties are just simply lack of development. You're asking the horse to do something it physically can't do. So, you know, you're going to get what you can get. If a horse can't get over its back in the canter, the canter is going to feel terrible. It's going to feel very hollow and, you know, and then it will fall apart to the point that we see, uh, we see a lot of Western horses these days, you know, who sort of canter weirdly in front and then have this weird trotting action behind you know they're just so totally disunited but of course what that does is it, just like all the things that hollow horses back tennessee walkers and saddle breads and all this kind of thing you know and they all talk about how you know it's just like sitting in an armchair well you know if you want to sit in an armchair sit in your armchair at home why make an animal do it for you you know so uh and all what all those uh kinds of riding have in common, which unfortunately we saw begin to creep into dressage, is this idea of taking the thrust out of the trot. So the horse becomes, it lifts its legs up, lifts its knees up, but it doesn't actually push off the ground. So in other words, it doesn't have any real thrust, it just is lifting its legs with its back collapsing in the middle, which once again looks like something who doesn't to people who don't know what they're looking at and it looks like something if it's a million dollar beautiful mover that just has so much movement that people are just gaga by what the movement looks like you know instead of looking is it correct or not or is it just a lot of leg movements going all over the place once again also why so many of these beautiful horses are going lame so young you know they have all this movement so it's even more important you know if you have a horse with you know that barely moves its hocks and kind of straight and you know, like some of the quarter horses used to be in Appaloosas and things like that, you know, well, you could probably get away with, you know, they're kind of straight behind anyway, you know, and their backs are kind of straight and, uh, you know, you could get by using them almost like a pack animal, like, you know, in a sense, I mean, not going to get by well, but, you know, in order to ride them. But the more we build these horses that are really like, you know, the equivalent of Formula One cars, you know, and then we don't ever change the oil on them kind of thing. So, in other words, the bigger the horse's movement, the more prone it's going to be to injury, and therefore, the more important it is that you get the horse working correctly over its back. So in other words, like putting a giant engine in a car, and the torque is so great, you don't have a suspension on it, and you know the whole car just rattles itself apart. Well, that's what happens to horses. If they're not over their backs, they just kind of, the wheels fall off after a while, as my father used to say. So once again, getting back to the trot work here, This looks a little better in this direction now, but once again, still quite high headed here, but it is swinging a little better. But once again, keep looking at those back legs and see how they're slightly out of sync with the front legs. It's like just a little bit of a lag and you see how the hind leg is still on the ground when the hind leg is way behind the horse's body. So it should be coming well forward before that if the horse were actually working over its back. So that's what we look for when we look for that change. Now, once again, this is a little difficult due to the, how far away the horse is in this picture. That's why I'm, I'm really suggesting everyone, once again, follow the link that I'm going to put in there um, because you can really clearly see um, 
better really in those pictures than what I'm getting an idea of here, only just because it's so far away. But once again, you're doing the exact right thing to just come back to the walk. Let the horse relax again. Because what, remember when we're lunging, we don't want to get horses too fit. If you keep running them around on their forehand, you know, they'll get fitter, aerobically fitter and fitter. So each time you do it, it will take longer and longer. That's really how you know whether your lunging has been correct or not. If, you're, if it's taking you longer and longer to lunge the horse, then you know that what you've really been doing is just getting the horse more aerobically fit. So it's taking longer, but yet you're not getting the right kind of control or relaxation or position that will allow relaxation. So only when horses are over their back, unless they're very dull horses, but even those you can tell the difference because as soon as we get them over their backs, they suddenly seem much freer, you know, so, uh, but if they're already the kind of horse going with the brakes on anyway, you know, and then they're hollow, you can just imagine that you really don't get much out of them. But this is the right approach you're taking. Once again, you can do lots and lots of walk work. You know, you can bring a horse back, you know, if you can't, just as you've done here, a few minutes in the trot, and if it doesn't get into the stretch, then just let him come back to the walk, get it correct where you can get it correct. And of course, that's where you always want to end on a given day. In other words, you want to end where it's as good as it possibly can be. So now we're going to the mounted work here. And once again, I would probably like to see the horse get further along before I rode it than I saw in this video. I'd like to see the horse stretching, but I see in some of these other videos uh, at your other site that you're getting that done. So once again, on this video, I would have liked to have seen the horse get longer and deeper um, before you rode. But once again, I saw that you did do that on the uh, in some of the other uh, video clips and pictures that you sent in the other file. So once again, I suggest everyone take a look at that when you get the opportunity. So for me, on any given day, I would have just liked to have seen this horse get a little more there. Or I probably wouldn't have ridden her, you know, for my money, so to speak. Um, unless I, you know, it's the kind of horse that I could particularly can, once in a while, there are horses you can get there. You know, there's always the exception to the rule. And of course we try everything, you know, and it seems like I can get on the horse and stretch it better, at, you know, under saddle, then I'm going to do that. That's rare, but once in a while, I do find that to be the fact. And you know, once again, and actually that's a little bit the case with this horse uh, and that now that your mounted work is looking better than the uh, work on the lunge line was. So therefore, it's all good. Once again, it's where you end up. It's, you know, uh, at the end of your session is what's important. You know, and we try different steps as we go along and just always remembering that rule. If you run into a wall, just go back to what came before it. You know, if you can't, rather than try to fight your way through, for instance, a horse that has a bad canter, there's no point in trying to canter it. Just go back and build the horse back in the trot and then you will improve the canter. And same thing in the trot. If the horse just simply can't do anything but be hollow, come back to the walk. And if you can't walk it over its back and get it to stretch, then you need to just go back to the groundwork because the horse's back is simply too weak to get the job done. But as I said, this is actually looking pretty good. There's a, It's a little bit of a once again, this horse's step is kind of quick, but it's not long and swinging right here. So we just need to get him much longer and get it swinging where there's kind of uh, the the movement of the horse's leg is too elliptical upwards. In other words, it's pulling the leg up, but it's not really letting it swing through, which tells me once again that the horse isn't, isn't through the back enough. Remember, we're looking for that efficiency of movement, not, you know, the horse collapsing in the middle and lifting its legs up has no meaning in terms of getting to point from point A to point B. That's really what we're trying to do is you know, perfect the, the machine, so to speak, if you want to think of it that way, of uh, that you're building. And unfortunately, what a lot of people do is just like if you wanted to build a race car, well, you've got to build the car before you can worry about driving it and handling it, right? And you'd go through all these test things. Well, the same thing is true of the horse. You have to get it working and all the mechanics working correctly before you worry about trying to do, you know, before you worry about driving it, right? You want to get the shocks on and you want to get the steering on and this kind of thing. And once again, understanding that getting the horse over the back is what solves all the problems with horses. When you see people having difficulties, it's always almost 100% of the time for the same reason. The horse is simply not over its back and being asked to do movements that it 
really cannot perform. And even if they do go on and perform them in a hollow kind of fashion, what we see, of course, in the show ring all the time is these horses go lame very quickly. And once again, that's why. It's like driving your car without the shock absorber system on. Certainly looks like a beautiful place you have to ride there. We also have some folks from Holland here right now, Yvonne and Diane. So I will certainly pass your name on to them if you don't know them already. <laughs> Now this is starting to look much better, but once again, as you go by there, you can see how the bellies drop, this sort of thing. But once again, the lower the head is going, watch how the legs are starting to swing instead of that having that kind of look almost like a jigging kind of trot that the horse is trying to do, where it's kind of you know doing this sort of rhythmic lifting of its legs rather than swinging through in a rhythmic way. Once again, a little difficult here just by virtue of how far away this, uh, this is for me to, to see a whole lot here. But I really like the fact that what you're doing is just walking, and that's exactly what you should do with a big horse like this. As I said once again, you know, the the big ones, uh, the bigger and heavier the horse are, the more prone to injuries they are, just by virtue of you know their own body. So we really have to build these big horses. It's it's quite the opposite of how people think about it. You know, people think just because the horse is big that it that it's strong, but nothing could be further than the truth. The bigger the horse is, actually, the weaker its back is. Now this is starting to look much, much better here. This is going to be the best part that I've seen here. But once again, just look at how the lower the head and neck goes, the more the back end swings through, and the less you get that little feeling of that uh, kind of phony, passage kind of walk that you were getting there, which kind of horses are bouncing a little bit there. Remember at the core of dressage, it's about efficiency of movement, you know, and. Uh, and of course, if the movement is efficient, it's less um, wear and tear on the horse, being the idea. So once again, that walk got to a pretty good place. I would have liked to have seen that get even longer yet before I went to the trot work. But uh, it was actually better than the work on the lunge line, just from that, from that point of view. But as we see here now, once again, uh, the trot is actually a little better here, even under saddle, than it was on the lunge line. So... Uh, but I don't know if that was this particular day because I certainly saw some other things where the horse went really well for you in your other little uh, uh, sight there. But you did the right thing there. Once again, it wasn't quite as round as we'd like it to be, so just come back to the walk again. That's exactly what you want to do. You can never go wrong doing this, you know. And the beauty of the stretch is always to remember, too, as you're learning you know, if you if things get a little frustrating for you, then, you know, by stretching, the horse forgives you all of your mistakes. Now, this walk is looking good. This is the best thing we've seen so far. Now the neck is starting to get out there long enough. But you're doing a very nice job of, of uh, not conflicting your aids. You know, once you get this idea that you don't pull and kick at the same time. Um, I really don't, not sure how this got started, but, you know, it's so uh, epidemic in the horse business these days of people thinking that, they're creating collection by holding against the horse's mouth and, you know, whipping them up. Of course, you know, they have to whip them to get them to do anything because they're holding onto the brake. So, of course, the horse doesn't want to move. So then you have to spur them and kick them and all this kind of thing. You know, and that's really not what collection is about at all. When horses have been physically developed correctly to allow collection to happen, it's, the, it's just as natural as doing, you know, whatever the next thing is. It's the next little hardest thing, but they develop into it. Once again, no horse can ever be really connected, you know, collected by pulling their neck back into the body. Because if you do that, the back is not going to work right. In other words, the horse is not going to be able to work over its back because you've truncated part of its uh, vertebra system, so to speak. So once again, back in the trot work here, um, Not quite as long and deep as I would like it to be, obviously. <laughs> and I think you just come back to the walk, and that's exactly what you want to do. So it's looking better. I love how active this horse is. You can kind of see as it comes around that corner there, it kind of turns like a boat. Because once again, remember a horse can't bend on, on side to side until it can lift its back. So longitudinal bend must happen before lateral bend. So to worry about bending a horse whose back is not up, of course, is going to lead to a lot of frustration because once again, you're asking a horse to do something that physically cannot do. 
how so many horses end up broken at the third vertebrae. This is looking better here. Now, this walk is really looking good. This is the best thing we've seen throughout this. And once again, if this is where you're ending, that's good. You know, every day it will be easier to get here, and every day it will be easier to get the horse stretching in the, in the trot. But once again, the better the walk works, the better the trot's going to be. The better the trot is going to be, the better the canter is going to be. But I love how you're just taking your time here. I'm not seeing anything. You're not overpressurizing the horse in any way. And of course, when we first get horses to stretch, they are act they are a little on the forehand, but they're on the forehand all the time if they're hollow. Just always remember that. When people tell you, oh, you're just running the horse around on the forehand, those people who have never learned to ride correctly will say to you when they see us riding and stretching horses. But once again, the goal is not to ride in the stretch. The horse, the goal is to be able to develop the muscle so that we can bring the horse up correctly without all the injuries that are happening to horses these days by having being forced into false frames. And once again, dressage should be the antithesis of all these other horse sports. So, you know, it's it should be for the people who really want to ride and connect with their animals in the purest way without any kind of physical force. Which means the horse will become a willing participant in the work that we do. Otherwise, as, as Bill Steinkraus said, I love this quote, you know, if you can't get the horse to like it, it's never going to be very good. And that's really it. It's like jumping. You know, there's nothing worse than jumping horses that don't want to jump and having to, you know, force them over every fence you come to. And usually they don't want to jump because they've been taught to jump badly and they don't know how to do it correctly. Now, once again here, this walk is looking better. Is it swinging? Notice how it's flattening a little bit. That's what we're looking for. And, it's, and the hind legs are starting to swing deeper under the body. And look how the neck stretches all the way down. So once again, we can still see, you know, under saddle, how this horse has quite a dip behind the saddle there. That's where the back is dropping away. And how why it's so important, you know. As I was saying earlier to someone today, it's like, you know, if this is not the right, right way to ride, why is it that this is the only way to correct the problems that are being created by people riding the other way that is forcing the horse's heads down, this sort of thing? So uh, think of that as an argument uh, if confronted about what you're doing. So once again, really good job. I'm going to put that other link in the in the site to this. Uh, so really great job. I want people to go and have a look at that too, because you can really, really see the horse, how much you've changed this horse. So you've really done a good job. You're well on track. Just keep doing what you're doing and know that it will just get better and easier every day. We just put A and then B and then C and then D, put all the steps in the right order, and uh, your horse will miraculously change all by itself. <laughs> by just doing the correct work, and that's what we want to have happen. This is Will Faber from Art to Ride. Thanks for sending in your uh, submission. I look forward to seeing this source in the future. It's going to be an interesting one to watch.